a very good evening to all of you. Welcome to this um, VAI Master Series, which is done in collaboration with Venus Association of India and Rocklexis. So today's topic of uh, discussion is Flevo Lymphology, a time to change. So the global prevalence of venous and lymphatic diseases is rising. Erroneous lifestyle, nutrition, sedentarism, uh, chronic stress-induced syndromes significantly influence the incidence and prognosis of chronic degenerative phlebo lymphatic diseases. So therefore, having a thorough understanding of the available scientific evidence and diagnostic therapeutic uh, innovations in phlebo lymphology can help improve the efficacy and safety and sustainability of current practices. So we are joined here by uh, an expert vascular surgeon, Dr. Atilio Cavesi. Uh, he's, a do he's a doctor and vascular surgeon at San Benedetto uh, del Toronto, uh, Italy. Dr. Cavazzi has treated more than 15,000 patients affected by vascular diseases, mainly venous. He was also the vice president of the Union uh, Internationale de Phlebology, which is the International Union of Phlebology, UIP. Dr. Cavazzi has been awarded a gold medal and honored with an award of excellence for international collaboration in phlebology during the World Congress of Phlebology in Melbourne in 2018. In addition to this, he has authored and co-authored books and publications on topics of phlebology, uh, lymphology as well. He's a teacher and has been speaker for phlebology and lymphology, related theoretical and practical courses, congresses in different countries of the world. It's a pleasure to have you with us here, sir. Please go ahead and take the session. Greetings from Dr. Pezzi from Italy. Uh, I sincerely thank everybody for this very nice invitation to share my experience with you. I want to thank Dr. Professor Bedi from the Venus Association of India and also Doc Plexus for their wonderful organization of this conference. I hope to share with you my, let's say, passion for flavor lymphology, but also for some more uh, let's say scientific fields which are uh, more and more entering our daily uh, practice and daily scientific work. So to make it short, I would start, I'm a vascular surgeon dealing with phlebology and lymphology, but again with the, something called, let's say, translational medicine and uh, epigenetics and so on. So the title of my <clears throat> presentation is Phlebology for Time to Change. So this is my disclosure slide. As you can see, there was basically no influence from any company in the conceiving of this presentation. I wanna start with a few, let's say, provocative slides, just to let everybody understand myself, firstly, let's say, how humble we should be in front of science, in front of biomedical science, and so on and so on. So as you can read from this, uh, nice uh, book, uh, science is provisional, and this is important. And uh, even more, it is important to, to read that science is a constantly changing base of knowledge. Keeping this in mind, probably whatever our knowledge, whatever our information, whatever our practice should be, uh, let's say, under revision constantly and should be used to have a, a, a good practice, but we know that we are not absolutely exactly knowing everything and doing the very best for our patients. So uh, another opportunity we have, uh, as I told uh, since the very beginning, is translational medicine. Translational medicine is an opportunity we have to merge different branches of biomedical field so to have uh, uh, different resources, expertise, and techniques to promote, uh, uh, let's say, the research, for example, and the diagnosis and therapy. So this interdisciplinary field should be kept in mind also in phlebology and especially in lymphology to improve somehow our health care for our patients. And then we come to epigenetics. Epigenetics basically is the way we change our phenotype without changing the genotype, without changing our chromosomes in the vast majority of the cases. We know that there is some change also in the chromosomes at the end. But anyway, it, we are talking about how 
our genes expressed are activated every single second of our life. How do they express and uh, translate protein into mRNA and proteins and so on and so on. So all the external and the environment factors can change our way of expressing our DNA. So we, we were born with one DNA, but then the expression of that DNA is extremely different as to what we do. And here you see the mechanisms, which as we will see are somehow in common with phlebology and lymphology as well. Of course, we don't know so much at this moment for phlebology and lymphology especially, but you see how methylation of DNA histone modification and the micro RNA are important because at the end, what we do through this mechanism because of uh, different factors is to activate, deactivate a few transcription factors. And so we might modify, silence or activate our genes. Why should we humble, why should we open our mind to changes? Just for example, Let's have a look at a few very nice examples. Saturated fats, they were heavy. They were really the, the worst thing in the world in the past. And now they are sanctified in the last decade. So you see how medicine can change. And if this is true, we should open our minds somehow also as vascular experts. For example, what is psychoneuroendocrine immunology? Uh, it is something that deals with the body and mind. And whatever we do in phlebology, lymphology, is also integrated with body and mind. And that's why we should talk about an integrative medicine. I'm showing you just a few very simple publications of ours where we tried to expand both under the diagnostic and under the treatment point of view, different opportunities we may have to improve our management of the patient. For example, concerning lymphedema, <clears throat> we made this narrative review where basically we highlighted the importance of weight control in any, any lymphedema patients, the way we could improve nutrition and in case uh, nutraceutical employment and the way we could fast or let's say uh, try to convince our patient to fast, especially when they are, of course, overweight and obese. And this is the, probably the majority of our patients with the relevant lymphedema. Also in lymphology, opening our mind to some changes, bioimpedance, spectroscopy is becoming more and more important, both to diagnose and to prevent all the issues with lymphedema and so on and so on. So that's why in this article, I decided to be very provocative because I personally consider lymphology extremely important in medicine, not just in vascular medicine, but unfortunately to manage lymphedema is a very complicated issue. And still we are stuck with very old concepts, but especially very old diagnostics and treatment. And this is uh, something to keep in mind because somehow, we know that uh, lymphedema is a chronic degenerative disease. And that means that we as vascular experts deal with this disease, but we also know <clears throat> that lymphatics enter all medical fields, as we will see furthermore. So we have some power also in, uh, for example, atherosclerosis, in the cancer, many other fields where lymphatics enter. And then another somehow neglected aspect of phlebology and lymphology is the rehabilitation issue. So the more we open our mind, the more we can change something. Now let's move to more specific topics. So if we deal with aging and generally talking with chronic degenerative diseases, it is important to keep in mind that 75% of our chronic degenerative disease evolution depend on, depends on our nutrition, on our lifestyle, and on our stress management. This is of capital importance. I mean, we have chromosomes. Beyond the chromosomes, we decide of our health. We decide how our chronic venous insufficiency progress 
and our lymphedema goes and so on and so on. This is based on epigenetics, but this is based on several factors. Because if we look at chronic venous and lymphatic disease, we could think that the very end issue to keep in mind is the microvascular and tissue derangement that we have in this disease. So we talk about edema, we talk about hypoxia, but especially we talk about oxidative stress and inflammation and the tissue degeneration in terms of fibrosis. So if these are the main <clears throat> patterns to keep in mind, as we see from literature, venous insufficiency is a matter of inflammation and oxidative stress. So we know that chronic venous disease is a chronic degenerative disease, which is related to a progressive increase of cell inflammation and increase of free radicals. And this is exactly the same for lymphedema, which is an inflammatory disease, which is due to a, a kind of a derangement of the homeostasis that we have in the tissue. And so there is an increase of inflammation and increase of free radicals. And again, we can consider lymphedema a chronic degenerative disease related to an increase of cell inflammation and free radical. Keeping this in mind, is it possible to think that each individual is responsible for 75% of the evolution of his or own chronic venous lymphatic disease? So we decide as patients how we want our venous or lymphatic disease to go. It will go better or it will go worse if we behave this way or that way. This is important for us as doctors to tell our patients. So at the very core um, base of any venous and lymphatic disease, we have inflammation, a kind of chronic low-grade cellular inflammation. So we are not talking about uh, like lipodermatosclerosis, dermipodermitis, and so on. We are talking about cell inflammation, which is the very secret killer uh, in case of cancer, heart attacks, Alzheimer's, and so on and so on. And it is at the very root of uh, venous and lymphatic disease. This is a, a quite important slide because I tried to summarize all those cofactors which may deteriorate chronic venous and lymphatic disease through several epigenetic mechanisms, which we don't know um, at the end, but we know a little, we are starting to understand more and more, but everybody would agree that, for example, obesity and overweight has a strong impact on the evolution of our venous and lymphatic disease. And you see here many, many more cofactors, which in fact, as we will see also, furthermore, interact with our patients and with their evolution of the disease. So let's go ahead. This is a very important uh, picture that I got from uh, a friend of mine, Erica Mendoza. You see, too often we deal with this and very rare we deal with this. This drawing is very important in my mind because I tell my patients all the time, if you want me to treat your varices and your leg, I need to treat the owner of the leg because otherwise the owner, she or he, will never change her or his wrong habits, lifestyles, and so on, and so on, and so on. So to treat the legs, we need to treat the patient. This is something very, very important. I can tell you very sincerely, I was in several, several, several countries and worldwide, there is a very little interest beyond the legs when we, diagnose and treat patients. And this is something that I, I wanted to change some 10 years ago when I started myself to treat obesity, overweight, autoimmune disease, and so on and so on. Because again, the patient must collaborate thinking about all this stuff. So this is the article on which I based this presentation of mine. It was published in Journal of Clinical Medicine. I reviewed, this is a narrative review I reviewed nearly 400 articles, and then I decided to write this narrative review to give some inputs to the discussion, how we could change and to improve the future perspectives in phlebology and lymphology. This is another article which was just published in the 
which has just been published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. And as you can see in the conclusions of this article, I tried to explain how we could merge different fields and how we should keep in mind patients' lifestyle, nutrition, environmental and psychosocial aspects to deal with one single entity and not just with one leg. So let's start this long, let's say, ride that I tried to be the shortest possible. So we we'll talk about scientific progress and chronic degenerative disease. We have to keep in mind that we are, we are living longer apart from the problem of COVID. Generally speaking, we are living longer, but dramatically we are facing an exponential increase of, in the prevalence of several, several, several diseases, as you can see here, and chronic venous and lymphatic disease as well. So we have increased and in the lifespan, we have not increased the health span. That's why our patients become older, disabled, and they consume a lot of health resources because they are stuck to drugs and technology. And this is also a question of scientific research, medical practice, which suffers from some reduction use because we just approach symptoms and signs and we need that too often several pathophysiologic mechanisms. And also we will see some biases accompanied in our lives. So let's start to speak about cost effectiveness. This is something very important. Uh, because if we progress, it's because we have better, I mean, we have better in terms of efficacy and safety, better diagnostic and the therapeutic procedures in combination with an adequate, possibly better cost effectiveness profile. So pharmacoeconomics is now trying to improve the way we go ahead with scientific research with new proposals, for example, in phlebology and lymphology. Very innovative procedures are fashionable, but sometimes they are too expensive, as we will see. So somehow we are dealing with chronic degenerative disease, we are dealing with aging, and that's why we need a more comprehensive diagnostic and therapeutic pathway. Just for example, the very issue of overweight and obesity, you see that about half the population of USA, half the population of USA by 2030 will suffer, will suffer from this disease. And this is incredibly expensive. So if we keep in mind this problem, this senescence in the cells associated with several expenditure issues, then we should open our mind to change also what lymphatics and veins do and how we could improve our diagnostics and treatment. So let's start from some biases, let's say in the evidence-based medicine, because we know what is evidence-based medicine. It is interesting, of course, but there are moments of transition in which our diagnostic and therapeutic proposals may coexist and we have no agreement. We know about the sclerotherapy, surgery or whatever. There are several disagreements. That's why our decisional process, when we have some uncertainties, <clears throat> we should keep in mind that we have not the truth in our hands. That's why we should tailor a proper uh, diagnostic and therapeutic treatment and their therapeutic approach, not just sticking to what industries or, or let's say the provisional truth tells us. Because we have also biases in the research and biases of other, let's say, uh, nature, which somehow jeopardize our critical sense. And let's look. This is the most important article in biomedical science, probably. This is the most read and cited article in the whole public library of science, PLOS. It's an incredible article from Ioannidis, a very, very well reputed scientist in the world from 
Stanford, and he speaks about false positive results. That's why most published research findings are false. It's incredible, this title, but unfortunately, it's incredibly true. As you see here below, he highlighted how several variables influence the final results of the scientific publication. So let's keep in mind this article because when I read this article, I was really uh, interested in the conclusions because we have to evaluate our scientific literature with a lot of uh, uh, critical sense, let's say. And these are, for example, the most common cognitive biases that I highlighted, so I don't wanna go into details. Uh, if someone is interested, you have my article, and so on and so on. So several cognitive biases which influence our own critical sense, our own scientific research. And then we have, unfortunately, industry-related biases, because we know that somehow <coughs> industry is important, absolutely important to uh, fund studies. Unfortunately, there is a proliferation of industry-based scientific studies. And that's why you see, for example, unpublished industry-funded study with negative results are quite common. And there are studies which are then retracted because of scientific misconduct and errors. And uh, it has been clearly demonstrated that there is a discrepancy between the outcomes of independent studies and the studies published with industry funding. So let's keep in mind this. And you see how several and several and several scientists are trying to raise the issue of how big pharma can influence our choices. Of course, without company funding, a lot of research would not be possible, but we have to keep a critical eye on whatever is released in terms of scientific literature. When we know that there is a need to reduce corruption, to reduce an excessive influence from this, uh, uh, let's say, intruding factor, let's call it. So it's also a matter of medical education. In fact, medical education is often industry sponsored somehow. And that's why doctors today tend to treat symptoms, signs, let's say varicose veins, let's say skin changes. But why do we have skin changes? We should keep in mind the importance of nutrition, of lifestyle, of psychosocial chronic stressors. And on the contrary, we should a little bit reduce the importance of all this precision medicine and genetic medicine that we deal with uh, in medical field, which are important. But again, 75% of our biomedical science is based on epigenetics. 25 is based on genetics. Now let's come to phlebology and lymphology. Unfortunately, the global burden of chronic venous disease increases because longevity increases and because the increase of the risk factors is effect. Obesity, disability, sedentarism. And this is exactly the same for lymphatic disease. That's why cost effectiveness in the future will become more, more important. Whatever the diagnostics, whatever the treatment we want to propose. And that's why pharmacoeconomic studies to assess costs, outcomes, quality adjusted life years, quality parameters are becoming important. Furthermore, many doctors, and I would cite immediately Mark Meisner, uh, stress the point of the patient reported outcomes because they are underused. On the contrary, the quality of life evaluation in flavor oncology should be, uh, let's say, as important as the occlusion rate, for example, when we deal with the uh, varicose veins, for example. So if we look more, let's say, widely, all these uh, issues uh, of uh, the great consumptions of drugs, expensive technology, is to keep in mind because our population in need of treatment is increasing. And so we are consuming a lot of resources. 
So we should ask for a better and a higher degree of collaboration by the patients. And as a professionals, we should have a, a new vision because we face every single day is a kind of accelerated obsolescence, obsolescence sorry, of several innovative diagnostic and therapeutic approaches in febrile infology. What was wonderful 10 years ago is absolutely useless nowadays. That's the case, just for example, of uh, uh, subendoscopic sub perforating surgery, SEPS. It was wonderful and now it nearly forgotten by everybody. So to make it short, let's assess with the more critical sense what we know. Let's start, for example, just very for, for example, what from the importance of obesity and nutrition to deal with our patients. This is a wonderful sentence which was found in an Egyptian tomb uh, 5,000 years ago, more six, nearly 6,000 uh, years ago. A quarter of what you eat keeps you alive. Your doctor lives with the other three quarters. So, diabetes. Diabetes is diabetes and obesity with this metabolism and so on. It is incredibly, incredibly increasing among uh, people worldwide, especially in the industrialized countries. So, we know that the venous and lymphatic disease are clearly worsened by obesity and diabetes because of several mechanisms. So notwithstanding this evidence, still we pay too little attention to weight control when we treat patients with chronic venous and lymphatic disease. And this is, a, let's say, a matter to keep in mind. In fact, many, many of our patients even show signs of chronic venous and lymphatic insufficiency, we can call it stasis. We have a microcirculatory stasis with tissue derangement, even without any evidence of any reflux, of any obstruction in the deep veins of any, without any evidence of lymphatic problem, just because they are obese, they have diabetes. So let's keep in mind this. Now we move to a very attractive topic, varicose veins. Well, we know that we need a color duplex ultrasound. We published a lot of articles about 25, 20 years ago about the importance of duplex. And then these are the quite well-known consensus documents, but still these consensus documents and this importance of color duplex ultrasound is a bit neglected. Why? Because we should investigate the patient much better at the saphenofemoral junction to know if there is a terminal competence or terminal valve competence or incompetence, and so on and so on. So, to make it short, our color duplex ultrasound should guide <clears throat> our treatment of the varicose veins because we know that at least 30% of our patients who have saphenous vein incompetence and viruses, let's say great saphenous vein incompetence and viruses, have a terminal valve competence. So maybe we, maybe we should tailor, in these cases, a different treatment, just for example. And, and for example, whenever we see viruses in our thigh and leg, these are not the great saphenous vein. This is, these are not the anterior accessory saphenous vein. These are not the small saphenous vein, but they are the tributaries. So that's why duplex should be considered of mandatory importance before any treatment. And then a mapping, a mapping should guide us. On the contrary, today we just stick the vein without any idea what we are doing sometimes because we have lost somehow the, the wish and the will to diagnose properly the patients. So that's why literature presents us always innovative treatments. But we know that the ancient hook phlebectomy, the inexpensive foam sclerotherapy, for example, with the Sari method are world wide accepted treatments. This means that they are very inexpensive treatments, quite radical. When we remove veins with phlebectomy, it is obvious. 
but still they are not so fashionable, they are not so innovative, let's say, in terms of industry. And that's why they are somehow used in a suboptimal way. On the contrary, we know that we have more uh, proposals every single year, <clears throat> but these new proposals very, very often have much higher costs. So why should we use change? Okay, so uh, we see that Kurosh Parsi, for example, clearly demonstrated that uh, blood is our enemy. To make it short, when we treat very large veins with foam, we have a lot of problems. We have a lot of recanalization, possible complications and so on. But after two lessons, just for example, you see how things change. So that's why we wanted that we want to use to make sense when we perform foam sclerotherapy, and then the results will be very similar to any other treatment. This is our presentation, our article about catheter foam sclerotherapy of the great saphenous vein with tumescence and saphenous irrigation. And these are the clinical, uh, the clinical results with 5% clinical recurrence at three years. And with, the, let's say, a cumulative 96.5% reflux free great saphenous veins at three years which is exactly what we achieved, and we published it in that article, at three years with catheter foam sclerotherapy plus tumescence and irrigation. And everybody would agree that these results are, are absolutely similar to the results we may achieve with the, the other treatments. And in this systematic review and meta-analysis, they clearly highlighted how this very inexpensive technique is uh, better than the traditional, let's say, ultra-guided form of therapy. And the overall results with this technique, for example, are interesting uh, in terms of efficacy, in terms of uh, safety, but especially in terms of cost effectiveness, as you can read from this, let's say, rough calculation that I did as to the Italian material costs. So when we treat varicose veins, we have to keep in mind that unfortunately, reimbursement affects our therapeutic choice. That's why inexpensive and underpaid procedures such as phlebectomy or foam sclerotherapy are often neglected in favor of molder and better reimbursed ones. But let's come to the point. We have an issue, the long-term high recurrence rate in the treated limb. It could be due to the technical strategy mistakes, or it could be due to the natural disease evolution, but this is a fact. So through literature data, I pointed out that the interprocedure difference in terms of saphenous occlusion rate is well below 10%. And at five years, around five years, the clinical recurrence, whatever the treatment for varicose veins, is about 30, 35%. If we look at long term, 10 years, then the recurrence rises up to 70% of new varices after surgery, chiva, and sclerotherapy, 58% recurrence for laser. We have no data for radio frequency. And this is clinical recurrence. So more than half of our patients after 10 years have new viruses after a proper treatment, probably, or unproper treatment. Whatever the treatment, more than half of our patients have recurrence. So whatever we say, whatever we write, whatever we do, should keep in mind, we should keep in mind this extremely high recurrence rate. And this could be due, for example, to the natural evolution of the disease, but also to the fact <clears throat> that we induce a local regional venous hypertension when we ablate. So we should not ablate too much. We should not ablate too often because 
Of course, we reduce both capacity and compliance of the veins in the trigger limb. And the limb needs to bring the same blood to the same heart, but the pathways are reduced in terms of morphology. And then these are data. Viruses progress 4% per year, 58% progression after 13 years. So a cost effectiveness analysis is important. Whatever our results at short, mid-term, we should understand that probably at long-term, whatever you do, you get quite similar results, especially in terms of quality of life. That's why if we understand that, for example, between 2013 and 2021, we had a 60% increase of the number of varicose vein treatments, we are incurring in a very high consumption of finances to treat varicose patients with little success if we spend too much and we get too little. And again, we should keep in mind, we are not just talking about occlusion rate. We are talking about also patient reported outcomes, which are very similar at mid-term and long-term, regardless of the treatment. Then we have another issue. What do patients expect from us? They expect something like a cosmetic improvement, let's say, quality of life improvement and so on. On the contrary, doctors want the success, efficacy and safety. And the problem is that we ask our success at one month, at one year, maybe at five years, but very, very rarely at 10 years. And the payers perspective, of course, is even different. So <clears throat> somehow cost effectiveness is what we should keep in mind when we treat varicose disease beyond physicians and patients' preference. Then, is varicose vein treatment safe? Well, so-so, let's say. For example, you see here a few figures. And then, for this reason, again, whatever the treatment you prefer, keep an eye on the possible complications. So, and when I listen to a few speakers who say that to reduce pain during the procedure, I prefer this procedure or that other procedure. And uh, let's say, okay, the patient will have a little pain less for some five minutes. And then you spend maybe $500 more for a few minutes of uh, less pain. And, or we don't want to mess because uh, it gives you some problem with those four or five injections in the thigh. I think this is a little bit ridiculous. Let me say like this. So we cannot prefer one method over another for these very, uh, let's say, limited parameters. So let's look at these wise words from wise doctors. I let you read because I don't want to go through all the sentences, but uh, Dr. Ricci. Dr. Marianne de Mesener, Dr. Erika Mendoza, basically they highlight how the income from the procedure, the push from the industries are important before we take a decision on what treatment we want to perform on the patient. We should be a little bit more critical. Now let's move to telangiectasias and reticular viruses. Well, here we should keep in mind primum non nocere, because we don't know this disease so well, and because patients have very high cosmetic expectation, and sclerotherapy is the gold standard. Anyway, very expensive technology-based intervention, such as a laser, cryolaser, and sclerotherapy are entering the market. And if you look at literature, we get similar or better efficacy and safety for sclerotherapy and telangiectasia than with those technologies which I mentioned before. But even more, when we treat reticular viruses, there is no comparison between sclerotherapy, which is much better than the other technologies, which cannot treat refluxes. They just treat directly the, the, the telangiectasia, let's say. So 
to make it short, there is very little literature and somehow we should not follow the patient's aesthetic expectation also because a few patients are really not completely feasible for our possible treatment because they expect too much. And again, technologies are not always the proper solution because there is an extremely significant cost disparity between sclerotherapy and all the other methods. And the results, again, are similar or in the majority of the cases, better for sclerotherapy. So our choice should not be based on non-medical reasons because somehow there are a few patients who could be treated with laser, for example, those who have some contraindications and so on and so on. But we know that for telangiectasia and reticular viruses, sclerotherapy is the gold standard and it is extremely, extremely inexpensive. Now let's move to deep venous thrombosis and to post-thrombotic syndrome. Well, this is a very complicated issue. We know that endovascular and open surgery interventions are absolutely good, but we also know that we still lack long-term validation studies once more. We have several critical issues because whatever we do inside the vein in the pelvic abdominal area, then we have a patient. And how is the patient's leg diaphragmatic pump? How is his weight? How is the rest of his life? So it's not so easy to say, I perform this treatment because I want to improve his leg for the future. Still, there is a, an overdiagnosis, an overtreatment due to variable changes in the imaging that we may have in these patients. And so again, we have a, a, the clear fact that endovascular surgical treatment are aggravated by costs and operational complexities in comparison to conventional compression treatment and anticoagulation, for example. So in post-thrombotic syndrome, if you wanna perform endovascular surgical interventions, as you can read here, you need to keep in mind a lot of the decisional factors which intervene in our process, decisional process. So <clears throat> again, let's not follow just the industry or let's say the, 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 the literature, which sometimes is a short-term uh, follow-up and, and so on and so on and so on. And we should include in a multivariate analysis uh, always when we assess our patient. When we deal with acute deep venous thrombosis, the evidence of pharmacomechanical therapy in acute TVT is still limited. We have two very big studies, for example, Cavent and Attrac, where somehow uh, the results are not completely favorable in comparison to traditional treatment. And last but not least, beyond the, the, the issue of the long-term benefit, we have the dramatical increase of costs you see here, when you use pharmacomechanical, pharmacomechanical therapy, you have a 24 months, an increase of $222,000 per dollars per quality. So this is something to keep in mind again. We should spend our money better. When it is indicated, okay, and that's the issue. When is it indicated? For example, uh, when there is a contraindication, we want the coagulation and so on and so on. But okay. And keep in mind also the possibility of getting some complications such as bleeding and so on and so on. So one thing which is important beyond the uh, occlusion and so on and so on is uh, that uh, in post-traumatic uh, syndrome assessment, uh, and you look at, for example, these procedures in the iliac abdominal vein, the primary cases go much worse than the secondary assisted cases. So we need retreatment in many of these patients because let's say that the surgery and endovenous treatments should be performed in extremely selected cases 
because of their debated cost effectiveness and <clears throat> limited evidence, <clears throat> especially at long term. Now let's have a look at this important uh, uh, study. Is compression therapy really interesting in deep venous thrombosis to prevent or to help our patients with the future post-thrombotic syndrome? My simple reply is yes, because of past evidence. Unfortunately, highlighted by eminent scientists such as Hugo Parch, Nikos Labropoulos, Giovanni Mosti, and others. This study was not so good at the very end, though it was so important and so on and so on. You see here a lot, a lot of flows which were highlighted. Just for example, the minimal duration of compression required was three days a week, which is at least uh, let's say we can consider it really strange. So the patient who could, could have worn the, the stockings three days a week, and then we assess if the stockings work. This is, let's say, not properly fair, not properly scientific. Pelvic varicocele. On one side, we know that we may treat pelvic varicocele when we have pelvic congestion syndrome, which not always the same, let's say the case. And uh, transcatheter scleral embolization is the therapy of choice, but the evidence is quite low. So when should we treat pelvic congestion syndrome? When we have symptoms, when the patient get no improvement from other treatments. So let's say still we have a lot of uncertainties in this field, and that's why again we should limit this treatment. On the other side, we know that primary and especially recurrent varicose veins can be related to this pelvic varicocele, especially in multiple women. That's why we should expand our diagnostics a little bit more in selective cases investigated through NGOCT or RM, sorry, MR, magnetic resonance, uh, the abdominal iliac veins. Now let's move to a very important topic, uh, leg venous ulcer. Leg venous ulcer is an issue, is a socio-economic issue. We spend, sorry, in USA, they spend 15 billion per year to treat patients with leg venous ulcer. So basically what we know is that treating leg venous ulcer means to treat maybe viruses, maybe post-thrombotic syndrome, but many more issues. Obesity, traumas, disability, musculovascular pump dysfunctions, sedentarism, diabetes, peripheral arterial obituary disease, and so on, and so on, and so on. Compression treatment, which is so inexpensive, heals about 80% of leg venous ulcer within six months. And thinking about the lower limb viruses treatment, it can even more benefit. So this is important. Why? Because regardless of this data, the large majority of leg venous ulcer is usually treated mostly by nurses with other methods. Let's have a look. <clears throat> when we treat leg venous ulcer without compression, recurrence rate is up to 70%. And the cost of leg venous ulcer treatment is more than double if we don't compress the patient. So you see, it's not a matter of nurse. It's a matter of culture. Whoever treats the patient without compression makes a big mistake. I know it's maybe ridiculous to tell this to everybody today, but let's keep in mind that the prevalent ulcer care culture is based on topical dressing and the so-called advanced medication, which have a very high cost. And for example, 
generally speaking, if you look at literature, the advanced group pressing are not recommended as a general routine, especially at the moment. Maybe they may have a role in patients with large and painful leg venous ulcer. So another treatment we have beyond the advanced medication is the surgical endovascular treatment for the deep veins. But again, we have a 35% increase of costs. Even worse, when we use skin grafting, we have a five-fold increase of costs in comparison to conservative therapy of superficial surgery. So skin grafting is great, but in very, very selected patients once more. So what, for example, does Cochrane Review say? They say that the healing rates of the leg venous ulcer, the recurrence rates, the quality of life, and the adverse effect are best when we use compression treatment and superficial venous surgery. And that's why we should keep in mind these are the treatments. Also because too often we forget about the core factors. So whatever we use for our patients, we have to remember that the ulcer is the daughter or the son, the child of a leg pump dysfunction in many, many, many cases. Is the child of obesity, let's say, in many, many cases. This is the wonderful full calf muscular venous part. And this is so wonderful that it prevents from venous insufficiency or venous ulcer, even with large viruses. But unfortunately, leg venous ulcer is associated to calf muscle pump dysfunction in many cases. Like, uh, like, uh, uh, let's have a look at this patient, for example, and the ankle mobility is important. Our, my friend, our friend Malai Patel always stresses the importance of the so-called phleboarthrosis. How important is our uh, joint mobility in this patient? And you see here one patient who has a very bad condition in his leg, but he has nothing in his venous and lymphatic vessels because he just leaves standing due to his psychopathic, um, psychopathologic condition. So he leaves standing. This is a patient of mine. He leaves standing. He does not move. He does not want to move. He sleeps four hours per night. And that's how his legs look like. It depends on the palm. He has got now ulcer, but he doesn't want to move. Just an example of how the pump is important. But even more than the leg dysfunction, is important the diaphragmatic pump, as you can read from these studies. So let's keep in mind the importance of diaphragm. Now we move, and we are going to the end, to the lymphedema issue. You see here a few examples, lymphedema, post-mastectomy, post-quadrantectomy, and so on and so on. So lymphedema, as I told you at the very beginning of this conference, is based on many old concepts. And the outcomes are suboptimal, especially in the mid to long term follow ups. Why? Because we don't know lymphedema well, we don't know well how to treat it, and because many factors again interfere with our treatment. For example, obesity, calf pump and breathing dysfunctions, nutrition, and so on, and so on, and so on. It is an inflammatory chronic degenerative disease. And last but not least, scientific literature is not so good because unfortunately, even guidelines and recommendations are still, let's say, suboptimal. We should keep an eye on obesity as a major problem in lymphedema patients. You see here a lot of literature is coming <clears throat> out more and more. And let's keep in mind, this is what we knew, and this is what I published in my book about phlebolymphedema in 97 and 98. But this is old, and especially this is wrong, startling hypothesis. This is what is true today from Levick and Michael. We discovered that nearly 90% of the fluids in the lower limbs is reabsorbed by the lymphatics. 
So lymphatics are extremely important when we deal with edema in the leg. And this is also something that we tried to stress through this book long, long time ago. And we tried also to, to explain the concept of phlebolymphedema because it's a single unit which drains fluids and macromolecules. Let's have a look at this quite, let's say, disappointing guideline. This is the guideline, the consensus from the International Society of Lymphology. And this is a very sincere statement. No treatment has undergone a very careful, let's say, assessment. And there is uncertainty, ambiguity, flexibility, dissatisfaction with the current lymphedema evaluation and management. So we expect some improvement. To improve, we need to change our mind a little bit to include some translational and integrative medicine in this treatment. Because so far, what we are doing with lymphedema is to squeeze fluids without addressing the core lymphatic tissue. Because we don't know, because we can't, because often there is a genetic issue below anyway compression treatment is still the cornerstone of this treatment of lymphedema. We also know that the lymphatic system does play a relevant role in several, several uh, con con chronic degenerative diseases. And that's why we should enter, for example, many other issues such as, uh, uh, many other biomedical fields such as uh, oncology, immunity, uh, arterial disease and so on and so on, as lymphologists, let's say. And that's why if lymphedema treatment is a little bit disappointing and we spend money for that, we should involve patients in the treatment. Self-management in lymphedema patients is cost-effective, especially by means of compression and more recently by means of, just, uh, by means of adjustable compression reps. So self-management, can help us to improve the outcomes, but especially to improve cost effectiveness. So patients must be aware about the, their possibilities to treat themselves through compression in some form of lymphatic drainage, but also they should know the negative influence or positive influence of lifestyle, nutrition, and other psychosocial factors. Okay, we said about that. We said about the importance of lymphatics and they are discovering more and more and more the importance of lymphatics in biomedical science, even in presence of several neurodegenerative diseases. So can you imagine how we can change? We can become the doctors who treat Alzheimer, who treat Parkinson, because we can somehow treat lymphatics? Question marks. So. Let's keep in mind that neurodegeneration is a matter of neuroinflammation. And the drainage of the lymphatic vessels through the glia, the lymphatic system, is so important that there are people trying to improve this drainage and to deal with these neurodegenerative diseases. So we know that we should prevent and detect lymphedema as soon as possible. So the surgery, especially in terms of microsurgery, can have a role, but it is debated because, again, it has high costs and it is uh, performed appropriately only in very few centers. So in absence of sound evidence, again, surgery in lymphedema should be used only in those cases which do not respond to a few cycles of compression, uh, of a com combine the congestive treatment. So we uh, try to work in a conservative manner. If after a few cycles, things go wrong and the lymphedema worsens, then we can think about uh, surgery. So let's move to the very ending part of my presentation. The way to assess our patients should be dedicated to find appropriate criteria to tailor proper diagnostics, to tailor proper treatment. Let's keep in mind that medical errors together with diagnostic 
and treatments are the third leading cause of death in the USA, the third cause of death. We are the third cause of death. And 20% of medical care was rated as unnecessary. We talk about over-treatment. That's why Passman, a great guy, a great past president of the American Women's Forum, he wrote a wonderful article in uh, a few years ago, I think two years ago, and what began as whispers, he was talking about the incredible over-treatment and over-diagnosis, which was featuring the American, uh, let's say, healthcare for venous and lymphatic disease. So he was claiming that we need a better uh, reassessment of the way we treat our patient. And then the American Venus Forum decided to edit, to release this nice document where you find a lot of recommendation, you can agree or not agree. But again, they say that the deep vein procedures should have a selected indication. And in this document, I was very, uh, let's say, uh, uh, how can I say, I was a little bit shocked <laughs> when I read that they suggested not to treat healthy veins. Can you imagine? Please do not treat healthy veins, okay? Uh, so let's go to the, the very end. <clears throat> okay, we have also the issue of eminence-based medicine. Eminence-based medicine means that the major centers decide what we do. So we should, on the contrary, target the best practice at convenient cost. So we have flows of patients, health professionals, industries, politicians. I don't want to go to too, too long, but we need to think about the choosing wisely movement, which is moving a lot to reduce the expense. And that's why the next Congress in Germany speaks about the choosing wisely. This is one of my very last slides. And it is an incredible slide, which I leave it to you. As you can see, only 11%, this is an article which was published in the uh, British Medical Journal. So as you can see, only 11% of our treatments in general in biomedical fields are beneficial. All the rest are not completely supported by randomized controlled trial evidence. So medical industries should help, but should not intrude too much. And that's why medical practice should be a transitive relationship between a truth of reason and a truth of fact. Hints among evidence, doctor and patient. We have to keep in mind the singularity of each subject, and we have to keep in mind the necessity of a patient-centered approach before dealing only guidelines or only industry-based uh, proposal, let's say. So we should move away from the medical reductionism. We should include translational medicine, epigenetics, and integrative medicine to have a, a major uh, change in phlebolymphology because also patients should help us, they should know more, and also doctors should refuse, let's say, physicalism, reductionism, and the ethical support from industry is important. So the final is to have a more patient-centered approach to chronic and venous and lymphatic disease and a more appropriateness of our decision to have a consequent socioeconomic sustainability for the, our management. Before embarking in new costly therapies, we should think about patients and appropriateness of the costs that we are sustaining. So you see here also the tie that our leading uh, key opinion leaders in other medical fields may have with industry, for example. And to make it short, and this is the very last slide, the message to take home. Again, let's question the root pathophysiology mechanism of a single disease. So we should use drugs, we should use surgery, we should use technology, but always in combination with good nutrition, 
correct lifestyles and proper stress management. Last but not least, cost of effectiveness and appropriateness of the available diagnostic therapeutic means should be an integral part of any medical decisional process. So I apologize because it was a bit long, but I put so much emphasis and passion in my presentation that I wanted to share with you a lot of issues which I uh, let's find, let's say I found in the literature and I tried to share with you. And we are doctors who can really uh, lead this change. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you. So my first question is, do epigenetic factors influence the progression of chronic phlebolymphatic diseases and how? I tried to explain uh, throughout my presentation that epigenetics has several mechanisms. I spoke about methylation, microRNA, and other things, uh, uh, but it's not so important at this point which are the mechanisms. It's important, important to recognize that epigenetics is very important when dealing with phlebolymphology and let's say with biomedical science. Absolutely, yes. You know, phlebology and lymphology means patients, and patients means lifestyle. And that's why I listed so many cofactors which interfere with our management of the patient. Overall, obesity, overweight, but also, as I told you, the pump, the way patients live, the way patients sleep, and so on and so on and so on. So, absolutely, yes, still there is a lot of work to do, and there are a few diseases which suffer. Uh, which, uh, sorry, are more influenced by epigenetic factors, uh, cofactors, and there are other diseases which are less influenced. But the evolution of the disease is absolutely under the control of what the patient does. So lymphedema, or let's say uh, thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis, will have a different prognosis, a different evolution in terms of uh, lifestyle, nutrition, and so on. Whatever the patient does influences the future of his leg, to make it short. Thank you so much. My next question is, what are the major hurdles that you see in the comprehensive management of chronic penis and lymphatic diseases? Well, this is a wonderful question because I would reply the patient, the doctor, the industry. The patient, because the patient does not want to change his lifestyle, his nutrition, his uh, psychosocial life. So he prefers pills, he prefers technology instead of changing. So that's the very first issue. The second issue, the doctor. The doctor loves success, maybe loves money, but anyway loves also patients. But the doctors uh, sometimes does not want to embark in tiring, complex, care of the patients, which includes, of course, also suggesting better nutrition, suggesting better movement, and so on and so on. So sometimes the doctors are stuck with the technology, and they are very, very much influenced by industries, and so on and so on. The third factor is industry, because industry, unfortunately, should have a benefit from its work, or fortunately, it depends. But whatever the issue, Industries tend to push for innovative technologies beyond the real necessity and beyond the really efficacy and safety at long term. That's why cost effectiveness should be uh, considered. So there are several uh, issues, but the cultural change is possible. And that's why my presentation was aimed at changing something, let's say. Yeah, well, I, I say that it's uh, the very time that it is there's the very first time that I am allowed to to present so much material which is uh, soundly based on uh, literature, and uh, it is not uh, let's say a traditional material because we are not speaking conventional topics. But I hope that this movement, which is called choosing wisely, will enter phlebolymphology as well. And this is important because I think that doctors, especially in this new world that we are facing, should have a, a much more involvement in the decisional processes in phlebolymphology, of course, 
and in, in all biomedical fields, as well as patients should be informed much more about their own destiny if they do not change some, some let's say, erroneous lifestyle and nutrition and so on and so on. So thanks really a lot for this opportunity. So this brings us to the end of our session. Thank you so much, Dr. Kavizi, for uh, joining us today despite your health concerns. I am extremely uh, obliged, uh, you know, for your uh, efforts that you put in together for this lecture. Uh, we would love to host you again very, very soon. And also to our dear audience, thank you so much for your loyal viewership and for your questions. Have a great evening ahead and thank you so much. Bye-bye.